Hello and welcome to News Now on TV360. I am Thelma Okuru. The House of Representatives have suspended former chairman of the House Committee on Appropriation, Abdumumun Jibrin, for 180 16 days. Jibrin is a lawmaker from Kano at the center of the unfolding budget padding scandal. He was suspended for allegedly breaching the practices and precedents of the House of Reps. According to the House, Representative Jibrin is also required to tender a formal written apology to the House before his future resumption of duties. He is also barred from positions of authority in the House till the end of the 8th Assembly. His suspension followed a motion recommended by the House Ethics Committee Chairman Nicholas Osai and adopted by the whole House. Jibrin had failed to appear before the Ethics Committee after being invited by the panel. He accused top members of the House, including its Speaker Yakubu Dogara, of pardoning the 2016 budget with fictitious projects running into billions of naira. The Edo State Governorship election on Wednesday commenced in the southern region of Nigeria. Residents trooped out in their numbers to decide who takes over the baton of leadership in the state for another four years. The highly anticipated election earlier slated for September 10th was rescheduled to Wednesday, September 28th, following a warning from security agencies about an imminent security threat. Nineteen candidates were vying for the tickets to the government house. But the main contest is seen to be between Godwin Obaseki of the All Progressives Congress, uh, which is the ruling party in the state, and Osage Izeyamu of the People's Democratic Party. Voting began by 8 a.m. in the state and is expected to stop at 2 p.m. The candidate of the People's Democratic Party, Osage Izeiemu, has protested the presence of the governors of Lagos and Kaduna states, Akiomi Ambodi and Nasi Arufai in Edo state. He said their presence in the state was worrisome in the face of the restriction placed on movement of persons within the state. Izeiemu also said that the PDP had written to the Inspector General of Police on several alleged arrests and harassment of supporters and had received the assurances that the police in the state would be called to order. Meanwhile, the APC has replied Izei Yamu saying his complaints have no effect as the governor did not influence the process of the election in any way. Edo State Governor Adams Oshomole hit back at the PDP candidate, describing his claims as false. The Lagos State Government has also dismissed the allegations in a statement signed by the state's Commissioner for Information and Strategy, Steve Ayorinde. The government described the allegations by the PDP candidate as reckless and disgraceful. Ayorinde while clarifying the position of the government said Governor Ambody was presently overseas for an official assignment and in any case had no business being in Edo State on election day. A federal high court in Abuja has adjourned the alleged forgery case against Senate President Bukola Saraki and his deputy K. Kweramado till October 7, 2016. The case was adjourned following a request by the council to the Nigerian government. The prosecuting council had claimed they were not prepared for the case and needed more time to prepare. Meanwhile, the defense counsels have also asked the judge to quash the allegations brought against their clients by the federal government. After listening to the parties, the judge adjourned the case to October 7 to hearing of the motions and trial. The two Senate leaders are facing trial alongside a former clerk of the National Assembly, Salisu Maikasua, and his deputy, Benedict Efechiri. The principal officers are accused of illegally altering the Senate standing rule, using electing leaders and inaugurating in the upper legislative chamber. The Nigerian army says it will launch another offensive approach to rescue all abducted persons irrespective of their locations in the country. Codenamed Operation Rescue Final, the operation is aimed at ensuring that kidnapped people in the country are rescued in the shortest time possible. Chief of Army Staff Lieutenant General Tukoburotai confirmed the creation of the operation on Wednesday when the House of Representatives Committee on Army, led by its chairman, Rimande Shawulu, paid him a visit in Abuja. On his part, the chairman, House Committee on Army, commended the Nigerian Army for the motivation to fight even in the face of obvious poor infrastructural facilities in the barracks and formations visited. I want to announce here for the first time that our next operation, which will soon come on board, is Operation Rescue Final. This 
Operation Rescue Funnel is aimed at freeing or rescuing all abducted persons. And this we intend to commence preparation. And once we start, we won't relent until we make sure that everybody is uh, rescued. This is our target and we must be deliberate. And uh, on this regard, I request the Honorable House to give us the support uh, to ensure that uh, this succeeds. And I want to tell you, Honorable Chairman, that the Nigerian Army Rules of Engagement, first and foremost, is about protection of human rights. And this is derived from our constitution, our constitutional responsibility to defend Nigeria from external aggression and indeed to defend her integrity as well. Therefore, whatever we do is never deliberate and we want to assure you that we conform uh, to the rules of engagement and in the best interest of uh, Nigerians. We are also aware that in the charge of their responsibilities, the army has been accused of violation of human rights. At the interaction we have with the House of Commons of the UK, earlier this year, this issue was brought up by several persons, including very senior members of the House of Commons and the House of Lords, that interacted with us. We agreed at that meeting in the UK, and we are working with other parties to further discuss the challenges security forces in the region are facing. With the view of the fact that the definition of enemies has changed, and as well as the tactics and strategies of such groups are usually not conventional. And so, uh, we hope that the appropriate legislation should be updated to meet the current challenges to protect the people, as well as provide the enabling environment for security forces to operate freely. The Nigerian army has refuted reports that Boko Haram insurgents have hoisted flags in some communities near Chibok, Borno State, Northeast Nigeria. The British Broadcasting Corporation, BBC, had earlier reported that insurgents hoisted their flags in three villages in northern Borno State after overrunning the area. The report said the attack followed another one on Monday evening in, all, in three other villages. However, a statement by the army spokesman, Colonel Sani Usman, said the troops of the Operation Lafayette Dole are maintaining a high level of vigilance in and around the area to forestall infiltration by the terrorists. Usman said there was no presence of the sect near the reported location. Governor Kashim Shetima of Bonu State has promised to rebuild churches and other structures destroyed by Boko Haram insurgents in Lhasa as he visited, visited liberated communities in the southern senatorial zone of the state. Shetima said the churches would be built before Christmas ahead of this year's Yuletide. He expressed shock at the magnitude of destruction, saying that the government would commence the rehabilitation in a short period. The African Development Bank is set to lend Niger a total of $4.1 billion over 2016 and 2017 and $10 billion by 2019, its president has confirmed. The bank's president, Akimumi Adishino, said he would go to the Pan-African Lenders Board next month to seek approval for the first $1 billion loan to cover budget deficit. We will support Nigerian government uh, with a budget support to be able to deal with some of the uh, domestic fiscal imbalance that, that, that they have. Um, you know, we are looking to uh, uh, consider for our board, you know, a billion dollars to help them to uh, deal with that particular uh, deficit that is there. Uh, in addition to that, there are other challenges that the economy has, which is in terms of diversifying and deepening the level of diversification in critical sectors. Uh, so agriculture, uh, solid minerals are very important. Manufacturing is important, as well as industrial sector. And so the bank will provide in total, between uh, 2016 and 2017, um, you know, a total of $4.1 billion uh, to, to Nigeria in various areas from power to uh, infrastructure to agriculture uh, and the private sector for SME uh, finance uh, lending. Um, I expect that our, our uh, portfolio in Nigeria will not decrease, it will actually grow. Uh, we will input, you know, expect to invest in Nigeria by 2019 a total you know, of $10 billion 
uh, uh, dollars in terms of our portfolio. So let me just say that the issues that we think are important are the importance of uh, the need to uh, further deepen the diversification of the rest of the economy. Um, but also the importance of making sure there is macroeconomic stability as well as fiscal stability in the country. Uh, we've asked for, in the discussion, the need to have better synergies between the macro uh, uh, policy side, uh, the monetary side of the economy, and also the fiscal side uh, of the economy. And of course, uh, we also recognize uh, that uh, power is perhaps the uh, most important challenge that is driving inflation uh, in the country. And so we expect uh, from our portfolio this year to invest in a total of over 1,400 megawatts of projects that are going to be focused on the uh, energy sector. And by 2017, we plan to invest in about 1,387 megawatts of project generation uh, for, uh, 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 for the sector. Um, as Dr. Adishino said, we're, we're looking to them for the $1 billion budget support. But beyond that, there are a number of loans and initiatives around agriculture, around job creation for the youth, around solid minerals, around uh, women's empowerment and women's access to finance and finance for small and medium-sized businesses. So all the things really that this government and this economic management team are trying to deliver on. We see the ADB as a great partner and a great supporter, so we're very happy to have them here. We're going from here uh, to have a detailed engagement with Mr. President, and uh, we're, we're confident because the, this is a, a team that stand by us. They help us with technical support in, in various areas, and there's just this alignment of what they're trying to do and what we're trying to do. The president of the African Development Bank has also insisted that Nigeria is not in debt. He says the country is only facing a liquidity problem. Additional said the African Development Bank was ready to provide very strong support for the Nigerian government. Nigeria has tough times, but Nigeria is not falling apart. And when people talk about debt crisis, Nigeria is not in a debt crisis. If you look at the fiscal deficit of this country with regard to the GDP is just about 3 or 3.5 percent, which is still well below the 5 percent uh, for the Fiscal Responsibility Act. If you look in terms of the debt to GDP ratio for Nigeria, it's 15 percent. And so there is no debt crisis in Nigeria. What you have is a liquidity problem. And we are trying our best to be able to help the country to solve that, to be able to drive down inflation, uh, to be able to also make sure that we working with the government, they provide the necessary incentives to the private sector because to come out of a recession needs more than government. It needs the private sector. So incentives are going to be very important. The Minister of Finance talked about a whole raft of incentives they are going to give, and I think that's the right direction. I'm happy to be here. I just want to say that Nigeria is not uh, falling apart. Uh, I think we are here to support Nigeria. Nigeria will come out of this as a better, more diversified, and more resilient economy than it went through a recession. I believe that. Members of the Nigerian Senate have rejected calls for the Nigerian government to sell off some of the country's assets in order to grow the economy away from recession. The decision was taken by a voice vote after the motion was moved by the Senate Minority Leader Ali Undume. Nigeria is currently in a recession after official data from the country's Bureau of Statistics show that its gross domestic product contracted by 2.06%. The federal government is considering the sale of national assets to generate funds to finance key infrastructure projects and to also generate enough liquidity to pull the economy away from recession. The Nigerian Senate resolved to investigate allegations of $13.92 billion illicit financial flow involving MTN as well as four banks and the Minister of Trade and Investment, Okechiku Enelama. The resolution followed a motion filed by Dino Malaye, an APC senator representing Kogi West, who said MTN had connived with some influential and unpatriotic Nigerians to illegally repatriate the money out of Nigeria between 2006 and 2016 in violation of the Foreign Exchange Act. Melaye named Enelama as one of the influential Nigerians who worked with MTN to transfer the huge amount of money out of the country. He said the figures were floated and incorporated in offshore accounts. 
Meanwhile, MTN has now denied the allegations. The allegation threatens to raise tensions between Nigeria and MTN just three months after the South African firm agreed to pay a reduced fine of 330 billion naira in a settlement with Nigeria over unregistered SIM cards. MTN is the largest mobile phone operator in Nigeria, which accounts for around one third of the company's revenues. The company had threatened to pull out of the country during the dispute over unregistered SIM cards. The 71st session of the United Nations General Assembly closed a few days ago in New York, in the United States. One of the most anticipated events was the last speech by U.S. President Barack Obama. And on the sidelines of the General Assembly, one issue that caught a lot of attention was the first participation at a debate of 14-year-old Nigerian and American. Zuriel Oduwole at the World Body in New York. This time, her focus at the UN was lending her voice to tackle the issue of climate change and its effect on the lowland nations of the Pacific Island. These countries are slowly evacuating their communities, including children whose education is disrupted as they leave their communities to higher ground. After her speech at the UN focusing on climate change, she left for her scheduled private meetings with two world leaders, which is the Prime Minister of Samoa and that of Tuvalu, to hear firsthand the challenges they face being at the receiving end of the effect of global warming with rising sea level. Last December, Zura was invited by the UN climate change body to, in Paris to lend her voice in encouraging world leaders to act quickly in ratifying the agreement on reducing carbon emissions significantly. We talk about the threats. Uh, we are talking about uh, real disastrous events. Uh, and I refer here to uh, cyclones, uh, which impacted on our country. Very heavy rainfall, followed by long droughts. This week, uh, hailstorm. Really? Uh, it's uh, the first of its kind. And uh, on top of that, uh, forest fires the displacement of uh, our people from lower uh, coastal areas to higher lands and with the consequence of uh, difficulty of getting water. Sign on to the Paris Agreement uh, and also other major uh, greenhouse gases emitters like China, like uh, many other uh, major emitters. But we, we need uh, more than that. We, we need more uh, actions, more than uh, simply words. So therefore we, we call and urge our you know, like-minded countries like the US, now they have ratified the agreement. Uh, and other nations to follow through so that the uh, Paris Agreement, that is a global agreement right. against climate change, can enter into force and that its provisions can be implemented in full so that we can uh, reduce uh, emissions of uh, greenhouse gases to the level uh, below 1.5 degrees Celsius uh, above or relative to the pre-industrial You're watching TV 360 News now. We'll take a quick break and we'll come back. We'll look at business and sports stories. Don't go away. What is wrong with you? man saying no? I drew for more than one year. I mean, any moon shade or any more moon shade. I could have more long. Can satisfy any be or any moon shade. I was like, I can't be by. Hello, hello, my daughter. Let's say, let's say, I am sure you five minutes. My daughter, egg baby. You are deceiving another customer just like you deceived us. The same way he deceived us. Eh? Why? A Tony Shay. Boba, Kuro, let down, let down, let down, Boba, Kuro, let down, Yami, 
Baba, kulo le jeng. Workshop umi le le yi. Ebe ten abati inche. Noti inje. Ni alok pe ni workshop. Ibi to abati un work. Ni koma di shop. Ewo, you cannot base your business on lies. Koda now, it is corruption and it cannot work. Not in my country. Corruption not in my country. The Nigerian Naira plunged further to a new low on Wednesday, down 1.76% against the U.S. dollar on the parallel market, even as the dollar supplies continue to dry up. The local currency fell to 4.60 to the dollar on the black market, down from 4.52 at the close of trading on Tuesday. Though the Naira closed at 305 to the dollar on the official interbank market against 305 a dollar the previous day, traders say dollar liquidity remains a major challenge in the Nigerian currency market. A tourism expert in Nigeria, Austin George, has urged the Nigerian government to tap into the huge tourism potential in the country. George said tourism could help the country generate a huge amount of revenue, but only the government took things more seriously. He urged the Nigerian government to formulate tourism-friendly policies, which would help attract tourists and investors into the country. When you're doing tourism, Government has to identify locations where tourism uh, um, destinations are located. You have an education for the indigenous of that place, because they are the ones any tourist would ask questions. First of all, there must be the government willingness. I'm not talking about enabling environment now. Government has to create that encouragement. Government has to come up with a direction, policies that can encourage individuals and entrepreneurs to want to go into this. And um, that's why it's quite laughable when I see government officials asking somebody to come to Nigeria and invest. But they've not even checked our immigration policy yet. We live in a country where we don't have a tourist visa. And yet, we want to talk about tourism. Nigeria does not have a tourist visa. Investors in Nigeria do not have uh, resident permits. I can go to the U.S. today with a million dollars and I'll get green card within a short time. You go to Canada with $200,000, <laughs> you get your residency almost immediately. Here in Nigeria, you can employ, you can have a factory employing 600 staff and all you keep getting is an annual renewable SEPAC. And that's why why would any investor want to invest where he's not sure of his own residency? It's one of the things, the directions government has to first uh, look into. Why would I want to establish in a country where my, my stay is not guaranteed? We have this mentality when we set up any tourism franchise or business. We always think of the foreigners. We both will come. What do we both are coming? What we really need to grow in this country is, to, is the domestic tourism. That's what has helped South Africa. Domestic tourism, pe your people to visit your things. You have too many Nigerians already in Nigeria with over 150 million people. All you need is just 5,000 visitors. And you'll be okay. We well, keep waiting for the white man. There's something set up now around Maui and you're charging 15,000 naira per person. Are we really ready? Are we really serious about tourism? What exactly are we looking at to call tourism? They are all around us. Even Amulwe is a source of tourism. You'll be shocked how many people want to, want to visit Nigeria, they want to go to Lagos because they don't see Mulwe. With all the negative effects, is why they want to visit. They want to see more So these are some of the things we need to look at. And then government has to really create certain awareness for people to actually look at that what is in your backyard could actually be something of uh, great potential. 
Oil prices rose on Wednesday after sharp losses in the previous session, and industry data showed a surprise draw in U.S. crude stocks. Brent crude rose 28 cents to 46.25 dollar per barrel, while U.S. crude was up 20 cents to 44.87 dollar per barrel. Members of the Organization of the Petroleum Exporting Countries will hold informal talks in Algeria on Wednesday, but the chances of the group reaching a deal on curbing output to proper prices appear to be slim. Iran rejected an offer from Saudi Arabia to limit its output, oil output in exchange for Riyadh cutting supply. Iranian oil sources said Tehran wants to be allowed to produce 12.7% of the group's output. Shimon Peres, who served twice as Israel's prime minister and once as president, has died at the age of 93. Peres suffered a stroke two weeks ago. His condition had improved before a sudden deterioration on Tuesday night. Peres was one of the last of a generation of Israeli politicians present at the new nation's birth in 1948. He won the Nobel Peace Prize in 1994 for his role negotiating peace deals with past Palestinians a year earlier. World figures are expected to attend his funeral in Jerusalem on Friday, including U.S. President Barack Obama, Prince Charles and Pope Francis. The death toll from the migrant shipwreck off Egypt has risen to 202. 33 bodies were recovered on Tuesday, raising the confirmed death toll to 202, a local official has confirmed. Hundreds of migrants heading to Europe were aboard the Egyptian fishing boat when it sank in the Mediterranean Sea last week. For days, authorities and fishermen have been recovering bodies from the water or finding them washed up to the shore ever since the boat capsized of the Egyptian coast. Around 160 of those on board survived the accident. Niger's under-17 female national team has arrived in Jordan ahead of the 2016 FIFA Women Under-17 World Cup. The Flamingos are in Group C of the tournament alongside Brazil, England and Korea DPR. The teams resumed their training activities on Tuesday evening. They kick off their campaign with a game against Brazil. The 2016 FIFA Women Under-17 World Cup will be held in Jordan from September 30th till October 21st. This will be the fifth edition of the tournament with Niger appearing in the past four editions since its inception in 2008. The country's highest finish in the competition are quarterfinal finishes in 2010, 2012 and and 2014. Super Eagles coach General Rowe has included Granada's Uche Agbo in his squad for the opening World Cup qualifier against Zambia. The 20-year-old will replace injured Mainz defender Leon Balogu in the original 23-man squad. This is Agbo's first invitational to the national team. All invited players are expected to start arriving in Abuja as from Sunday 2nd of October. The Eagles were paired with Zambia, Cameroon and Algeria in Group B of the tournament. The team will start its qualification campaign with a game away to Zambia on October 9, 2016 and finish away to Algeria on November 7, 2017. Only the top team will qualify from the group. Former Sunderland manager Sam Allardyce has resigned from his role as England's manager after less than three months in charge of the team. The 61-year-old was appointed England's manager on July 2016 to replace Roy Hodgson, who resigned after a disappointing Euro 2016 campaign. However, his tenure was thrown into controversy on Monday when a newspaper allegedly showed him using his role as England's manager, manager to negotiate a separate deal for himself. The sting was conducted by the Daily Telegraph. The FA asked to see the full evidence from the newspaper sting and held a long meeting with a manager on Tuesday. Following the meeting, Allardyce has now agreed to step down from the job as England's manager. Guy Southgate, who is England's under-21 manager, has been put in temporary charge of the team ahead of the upcoming World Cup qualifiers next month. Allardyce, meanwhile, has apologized for his actions but says he was only helping a friend out. That's all we have on news now. Thank you very much for joining us. I am Thelma Okoro.